Welcome to the Walt Whitman Writers Series. We are pleased and honored today to have with us the award-winning author, Dina Magestu, I knew I was going to fumble that, uh, about whom Professor Maloney will tell you more in a minute. Uh, I want to tell you just a little bit about the Walt Whitman Writers Series. Um, this is a literary program that brings top contemporary authors to our campus to share their work and their writing experiences with students, faculty, and the larger Brooklyn community. We're very lucky to live among such wonderful writers, and the series seeks to take advantage of our location and connect our community with the creative minds working around us. I was lucky enough when I was an undergraduate in, um, in New York City um, to go to these kinds of events, uh, and I really enjoyed um, the way in which I learned outside the classroom uh, the classroom scene and um, in a different kind of environment. Um, so Dr. Maloney and I created this series with that in mind um, and with the generous support of Provost Tulahan have been able to bring many incredible uh, writers uh, to St. Francis over the last four years. Previous Walt Whitman Writers Series authors include Kate Christensen, Julie Oranger, Jonathan Lethem, Darcy Steinke, and Rick Moody. We are so pleased today to be able to add Dina Magenstu to our list. So thank you and welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as uh, Dr. Devlin uh, pointed out, um, we, we are very excited to continue uh, the Walt Whitman Writer Series today with uh, Dina Magenstu. Uh, we, um, we also want to let you know that uh, coming up uh, in the near future, we'll be hosting uh, Jonathan D. Uh, author of The Privileges, who recently won the 2011 St. Francis Literary Prize. So we're very pleased to, that Jonathan will be coming to campus. Um, I'm going to say just very briefly uh, just some of uh, Dino's uh, accomplishments to date. Uh, his uh, resume um, includes two novels. Um, he, in 2007, he wrote The Beautiful Things That Heaven Bears. Um, and in 2010, uh, he published How to Read the Air. Um, today he's going to be reading from How, How to Read the Air. He also has contributed articles on the conflict in Darfur for Rolling Stone, and he's also reported for Jane Magazine on the conflict in northern Uganda. Um, right? Um, he has a bachelor's degree in English from Georgetown University, and he received his MFA in fiction writing from Columbia. Uh, to list just a few of his many awards, uh, he was recognized last year in the very prestigious New Yorker 20 Under 40, which is a, a major literary accomplishment. He's a Los Angeles Times Book Prize uh, winner in 2008. New York Public Library Young Lions Award finalist in 2008 as well. The Guardian First Book Award in 2007. And the National Book Award Foundation 5 Under 35 Award in 2007. So we welcome Dino Mangetsu to our campus, and let's give him a round of applause. Thank you all very much. Does that work? Yes. Um, for being here, it's a pleasure to come, and thank you for the invitation. I, I used to live really close here on Columbia Heights Road for, for a couple of years until I got sucked away into a foreign country and continent, and now, um, now I can only come back for visits like this, but it's, but it's quite worthwhile. Um, I'm going to read from my second novel, which is How to Read the Air, but I think maybe before I begin, I'll, I'll, I'll try to set it up a little bit. Um, the novel is narrated by an American-born Ethiopian immigrant named Jonas Wildemariam, and this particular narrator bears some technical similarities to my own life, in that I was born in Ethiopia, and my family came to America um, when I was about two years old. But what I tend to notice more and more these days is we tend to have a kind of obsessive preoccupation about uh, authors' biographies and the kind of relationship between um, the author's life and the sort of narrator's lives. And sometimes we do that as a way of conflating these, these two different personalities. And there's a reason for that, I think, is that we want to, to find um, verisimilitude wherever we can. But oftentimes, I think there's something quite dangerous that happens as a result of that. And, that being that we tend to impose a kind of label and a category and a box onto a work of fiction because we think it belongs to the author as well. And more and more I find that uh, these boxes are, are incredibly limiting and they actually kind of destroy what to me is one of the most important reasons why we have fiction. 
um, we don't read fiction because we want to find a story that mirrors our own. We read fiction because we want to find our own lives in stories. And I find works not only like my novel, but like many other novelists who are um, from other countries or were raised in America, um, these categories that say that this is an immigrant novel or an immigrant literature, or that this is an African novel or an Ethiopian novel or an African American novel or a Chinese American novel, South Korean American novel, all of these things are, are, are quite superficial labels and they sort of, I think, um, minimize and uh, delegitimize both the power of the reader to, to engage on a very personal and emotional level with a work of fiction and I think also the, the attempt of the writer to create a, a narrative that while it might have some you know, personal relationship to our own background, we write because we believe in our common humanity. Um, I don't write because I want to give you the idea of the Ethiopian American experience or the immigrant experience. I write because I believe we all know what it is to be lonely. We all know what it is to want love in our lives. We all know that at some point in time we're forced to create a, a sense of home and identity. And these are struggles that are not particular to African immigrants. Um, they are struggles that are not particular to any ethnicity or identity. They, they, they sort of surmount those and they, they, they are greater than those issues. And um, I write always out of that concern. And I find it more disturbing in particular in an American literary context. And since this series is called the Walt Whitman uh, Literary Series, it seems important to note that, that we are a literary culture and a literary history um, that is more expansive, I think, than any place else in the world that I've ever been to. Um, it's a literary tradition that, and a cultural tradition that is, uh, allows room for constant growth. The same way I think that the country is constantly trying to sort of expand its definition of itself. Writers are constantly trying to expand the definition of what it is to be American. And that idea of being American to me is no longer limited to, um, to an ethnicity, to a color, to an ec economic class by any means. Every time we sort of write, we try to, in my particular case, bring another voice and another perspective of American history, of American identity um, into existence. It may not have existed before, but I think as soon as we enter this country, it does begin to exist. And we write these novels and we tell these stories because we want to contribute to that idea of a, of a culture and a narrative dialogue that has um, no limits and no definition, um, but that will kind of continually sort of expand as we expand. I, these, these are my new rants these days that I've come up with in, <laughs> um, over the course of a series of talks in the past couple of weeks. Um, but I think it's important to note that because, because I, part of the joy for me being back in Brooklyn is seeing that alive more so than probably anywhere else in the world, um, is you can see this sort of diversity and this range um, happening in it in this sort of constant state of flux, some of which is not always the way you would like it to happen, but nonetheless it still happens. And the fact that we make room for each other constantly, especially in this borough and in this city, um, seems to me kind of uh, more and more mir miraculous um, the farther away I get from here. So um, I'm going to read from an early section in the novel where the narrator Jonas Wildermayam is um, been living in New York and he has a job at an immigration center where he gets to make up stories, um, which is a lot like what I get to do these days. My job at the center was to read through the asylum statements as soon as they came in. Although initially I was hired only to answer the phone and deflect the frequent calls from creditors who were demanding payment for whatever minor services had been rendered to keep the office functioning. Money was owed to multiple Xerox repairmen, along with several different plumbers, and one electrical technician who frequently threatened to come down to our office. Undoubtedly, it was my name more than my English degree that had first gotten me the job, and then later the promotion that came with it, a change in responsibilities and a monthly subway card. Jonas Wildermariam. But it had a perfect degree of foreignness to it for the center's needs. Almost as deeply vested in America from the sound of it as John, or Jane, but with something reassuringly other at the end. I could be Jonas, or John, or just Jay. And of course, when my boss Bill needed me to, Mr. Wildermariam, who despite distance and birth, remained at heart an African. If many of the clients, especially those who came from neighboring, neighboring African nations, 
were disappointed at seeing me when they first walked through the doors. They were undoubtedly relieved by the time they met the white middle-aged lawyers who would perhaps someday stand next to them in court. It was one thing for our paths to cross on the street or at a restaurant behind the counter of a grocery store, and another thing entirely to stake our futures on one another. I had once heard Bill, who at 53 still hadn't learned how to whisper when he meant to talk discreetly, tell someone over the phone how lucky they were to find me. He's completely American, he said. But you wouldn't necessarily guess that from looking at him. It's important for the clients to see that. When it came to the personal statements that each asylum applicant had to write, my job, at least at the beginning, was to sign them to one of two piles which I, in my head I had listed as the persecuted, and the not so persecuted. The persecuted were the easiest to read through. The narratives almost always self-evident and succinct, while the not so persecuted tended to ramble and digress and include statements such as, it's been a dream of mine, or the opportunity to pursue there was never that sort of wishful thinking in the others. A cold, almost hard pragmatism was the rule of the day, with the governing philosophy simply stated as, I have nowhere else to go, or there is nothing for me to return to. Often there were statements such as, the village, city, town, country I came from, was born in, lived in for 45, 60 years, was taken over, occupied, bombed, burned, destroyed, slaughtered, and I, my family, my sister, cousin, aunt, uncle, grandparents were arrested, shot, raped, detained, forced to say, tortured to say, threatened if we did not say that we would vote, not vote, believed in or did not believe, supported or denounced the government or movement or religion of X. In the end, the consequences were always the same, and each ended with a similar emphatic note. We I can't, won't, will never be able to go back. It was only with Bill and the three other lawyers who dealt at great length with the clients directly. I saw them mainly as they came and went through the dimly lit corridors of our offices, which were undoubtedly worn and in desperate need of new carpet. I often exchanged nothing more than a brief hello and goodbye with them. Had it not been New York, the range of faces that passed through our doors would have seemed extraordinary to me. There is no chance of claiming that here. Any attempt to do so was thwarted by a greater chaos waiting outside. One of the volunteer lawyers who came down from the Upper East Side twice a month to work at the center once declared that our little office, with its vast range of clients, was the perfect microcosm of greater New York. After only a few months at the center, however, I was convinced that our office was not a microcosm of anything. It wasn't even a reflection of a larger whole which in fact was a myth to begin with. Our African clients were in the Bronx, a Chinese in a different section of Queens from the South Asians, while anyone from the Caribbean was in Brooklyn. All we had were thin, crooked, and fiercely territorial wedges that stacked next to one another. Those who came seeking help often did so with a faint trace of shame hovering over them, the sense that they were once again pleading to someone to grant them a right that everyone else they had passed on the street on the subway and in traffic took for granted. It was hard sometimes to look at them when they came in like that, and I would be lying if I didn't admit to adverting my gaze, even though Bill had told me not to. How else will, be they, will they be sure they respect you if you don't look at them honestly in the eyes, he had said. The problem, however, was that I was never sure if I really did respect them. Those that came in with those war-weary faces often seemed so desperate to please and to attach themselves to someone that all I could muster for was pity. On occasion, I would try to match their faces to the statements I had read. Who among this haphazard and wandering tribe was Afghani or Pakistani, Sudanese or just pretending to be because they knew it made the process easier? If I didn't know for certain when they entered, I assigned them the narrative that I thought they deserved. A gray-haired and prematurely stooped man who tried to look his best in his donation suit was the Iranian professor whose statement I had read a few days earlier, even if there was no chance that could have been true. His real life had clearly been much harder. The difficult stories, the ones that came with death or prison and rape, I left alone. I never tried to imagine who they belonged to. It made it that much easier to bring the clients coffee or tea before they had a chance to ask. In time, I was given the job of editing out the less credible or unnecessary parts of some of the stories 
while at the same time pointing out places where some could be expanded upon or magnified for greater effect. I was seen as the literary type in the office, with my background in literature and my supposed desire to get my PhD. Angela, one of the summer lawyers working at the center before her more profitable private law career began, would pass stories to me that needed to be touched or built upon. I took half-page statements of a course in often brutal nature and supplied them with the details that made them real for the immigration officer who would someday read them. I took, they came at night, and turned it into, we had all gone to sleep for the evening, my wife, mother, and two children. All the fires in the village had already been put out, but there was a bright moon, and it was possible to see even in the darkness the shapes of all the houses. That's why they attacked that night. It was easy to find the necessary details. They resurfaced all over the world in various countries for different reasons and at different times. I quickly discovered as well that what could not be researched could just as easily be invented based on common assumptions that most of us shared when it came to the poor or distant foreign countries. Bill put it to me this way once. When you think about it, it's all really the same story. All we're doing is just changing around the names of the countries sometimes the religion. But after that, there's not much difference. It was his suggestion that I borrow from one story to feed another. No one will ever know the difference, he said. And at least in that regard, he was wrong. After a few weeks of working together, Angela came to my desk. She was holding one of my reports. It was the first time she had actually read what happened to one of them after they passed through my hands. What is this, she asked. She handed me the report, the supposedly true life account of a family driven from their home in Liberia. It had been one of my, one of my more dramatic and to my ears better efforts. The family as I cast them forced to take shelter for weeks at a church while outside a militia stood waiting for them. This isn't even close to what happened, she said. They flew business class to Dubai. Who are these people? Angela wasn't angry so much as shocked at what I had done. One of the things that we'd always assumed about each other was that when it came to the clients, we both saw them strictly for who they were, with no sentimentality attached to them or their plights. And what I had done betrayed that belief. I didn't make them up, I said. It was true. Something similar had happened to someone else, although whether I had heard it in the office or read it in the newspaper, I could no longer remember. This isn't what I wanted, she said. Give me back the original. I handed her back the one-page report that told the all-too-common story of a family forced to surrender its business and livelihood to another that until then had neither. I tried to make the argument to her that it was only by a trick of the imagination that we saw this as special. We lose what we have and often try to take by force what we don't. When has this ever been news? When the report was passed up to the lawyer that would actually represent the family, it was rejected and passed back down to me with a note in Bill's handwriting that said, do something with this Jonas. Angela and I never spoke of it again, nor did we speak to each other for any great length of time for several days. When I asked her if she wanted to come for lunch, she simply said, sorry Jonas, not today, which was as close as she could come to saying that I disappointed her. Not because I had invented a new history for someone, but because I had seemingly no problem doing so. It was the ease with which I could lie that alarmed her. It wasn't until the end of that week at a boat party that the center had organized that we began to find our way back to each other. All of the lawyers were there, along with a few of the volunteers and interns and the clients whose asylum applications had recently been approved. The mood on the boat was supposed to be festive, a sort of goodwill tour of Manhattan with food from all the troubled corners of the planet that we represented, arranged on a buffet table with tiny tabletop flags from each nation. Halfway into the cruise, Angela found me standing by myself on the starboard side of the boat, staring out into what I guessed to be the very edge of the Atlantic. This is where you're hiding, she said. Can you blame me? Not really. It's depressing in there. I think someone's getting ready to give a speech. Aren't you afraid you'll miss out, I asked her. I know what they're going to say, she said. It's hard times. We've done the best we can. Our clients are an inspiration. She slid her arm across the railing so that it was touching mine. 
Are you mad at me now, Jonas? Not at all, I said. Would you say so if you were? Probably not. I didn't think so. That's your style. You're a brooder. Bill told me that he's the one who told you to change the statements as they came in. He said you were good at it. Lying comes naturally to me, I said. Yesterday, a woman tried to tell me that she had eight children and that she needed to get visas for all of them. She said she was 35. And how old was she really? 18? 19? 20, Angela said. 23 tops. I tried to explain to her that it was impossible to use that story. No one, I told her, will believe you. But she kept shaking her head and insisting that everything she said was true. Eight children, she said, over and over. She even brought along pictures. The oldest one was almost the same age as her. I wanted to tell her to go and see you and then come back to me when she was done. The boat approached the southern tip of Manhattan. As we neared the Brooklyn Bridge, more and more of the clients came out onto the deck. They had never seen the Twin Towers except in photographs and in highlight footages of the buildings as they were burning and preparing to fall. Most stood on the deck wondering just where exactly they would have been. A couple standing near us pointed to competing sites. One placed them just on the water's edge. The other close to the very bottom where the ferries bound for Staten Island departed. Bill came over and corrected them both. They were right there, he said, just behind those buildings. The couple, the couple focused their sights onto where he was pointing, and I could see them trying to recreate from their television memories an image of the towers, but the dense cluster of buildings that were there kept getting in the way. A year or maybe two years earlier, Bill would have stuck around longer and recounted to them his own personal stories of that day. He would have said something like, I was on my way to work, or I came to the office early that morning. I saw, or I heard, something that placed him square, squarely near the center of events, which was how he saw himself, as a slightly heroic man standing on the front lines. In this case, however, Bill wasn't alone. For a few years, we had all tried to stake our own personal claim on what had happened that day. That time had clearly passed, and the best he or any of us could do now was to try on occasion to set the record straight. Actually, maybe I'll stop there and uh, take questions if anybody has them. Everything works out lovely in the end. Um, great big happy endings for, for all the characters. Um, everyone has asylum and immigration rights in America. Um, uh, the story ends, I think, on, on, on a quiet moment of grace. Um, I don't believe in... in in happy endings, but I don't believe in sort of miserable endings as well. Um, you know, I believe that the characters are all um, searching for, for some sense of peace in their lives, um, and that the narrator Jonas is searching for some sort of peace to, to kind of confront these two difficult um, realities and histories that he lives by. And I think the story ends on, on that small moment of, of resolution where um, he hasn't kind of figured out the answers to his life or the answers to the world. He's, he's not... Um, something more successful, but he has come to an understanding of um, what is meaningful and valuable in his life, and that those things that are meaningful and valuable, um, his love, his friends, his family, are the things worth holding on to. Yeah, I think it was, it was I mean, it, it all happened to, you know, there was an oddly similar overlap in, that, in those cases where, um, regardless of whether or not his guilt or not guilt, but. Um, the idea that somehow, because this person had lied about their narrative, uh, that that somehow discredited them. And I was like, you know, um, the whole idea of, of narrative, in, especially in that immigration construct, is very much dependent upon who's reading it. And so um, there's no, um, people construct narratives depending on their audience. And we, in America, we have our immigration rules, which change according to our political needs. And so at various points in times, we are more interested in certain narratives. Um, we're more interested in certain narratives from certain countries. And so um, I know within my own family, it was easier for us to come to America because it was during the Cold War and the Ethiopian government was communist. And so it was easier to have an asylum process um, work for our, on our behalf because we could say that we were in opposition to a communist government. Um, in the case of her narrative, um, she found a narrative that, that sort of fit what she thought would sort of work for her. That, that's always been true. 
um, to sort of act as if somehow this is a new phenomenon is the most sort of uh, obscenely naive thing that um, people have tended to, to try to act as if this is a great big surprise. All the State Department does is train their, their workers to try to define the narratives that are not true or untrue. And when they have narratives that they know are not true, but they fit into a context that is still important for, for, for our national policy, um, then they overlook the fact that there's clearly holes and gaps in those stories in order to make them, them fit. Um, so it's, you know, we ask these narratives to be true, but at the same time, we're not looking for truth in them. We're looking for um, a reflection of our own kind of political necessity at the, in those moments. So, um, so in her case, yeah, I mean, I, th I thought, um, whether or not she lied or not was sort of irrelevant. It was the, the fact that we acted as if this was unheard of. Um, I'd say most of the stories that sort of pass through immigration officers have been doctored in order to get through those processes. I mean, it's, un it's an unfair system and um, it's an imperfect system, so. Yeah, and I, and I think that's you know, sort of especially true with the idea of an immigrant narrative, which is, um, it has become a bit of a, of a cliche. You know, we, we tend to sort of expect an immigrant narrative to follow a trajectory, and so you when you say that it's an immigrant narrative, you automatically, automatically sort of have these assumptions that um, are cast before the story has ever been told, which is that you accept a certain level of, of hardship, violence, and then gratitude and joy to be in America. Um, and all of that, all that does is it takes, a, takes out all the singularity of, of these particular stories. And so we become, a, we end up having a bit of fatigue you know, when we hear immigrant, the idea of the immigrant story, um, there's a kind of weariness with it because the same way we hear stories about war, violence in Africa or foreign countries, we have a kind of um, natural almost defense system to, to want to kind of minimize how close we're going to get to those stories because we've assumed now at this point that we know them, um, but we know them only as cliches. And I think the, the sort of hard part is, and the joy of imagination actually, is that you can rescue narratives out of cliché, and you can rescue them out of cliché by um, granting them a kind of particularity that makes them more specific to these, part, you know, to these individuals, to these places, but makes them more universal at the same time. It's when you sort of become invested in a character, when you become invested in a particular narrative, that you stop thinking about it as an immigrant narrative or an African narrative or an Asian narrative, but as the story of a human being. And that's, you know, sort of, what I think we're all trying to do by, by reading and by writing is to find the human beings behind the stories that we read. You know, I, I began this novel after I went, I went back to Ethiopia for the first time after 25 years, and my family was raised in the Midwest. I came from, straight from Peoria, from, from Addis to Peoria, Illinois, which is about the most bizarre journey I think you could, you could possibly take until I heard the Sudanese who end up in Fargo, North Dakota, and I think, God, you really got, <laughs> you really got the bad end on that stick. <laughs> Um, but the kind of, I think the, the, the origin of the novel had some, some beginning there where I was trying to see how these different sort of landscapes can, can kind of, um, would be seen by somebody like my parents or any other sort of immigrants who, who are forced to reconcile these very different worlds, um, both physical topography and kind of cultural differences as well. Um, and then there's another part of me that was also very determined to argue for this novel not to be kind of or just against that kind of general categorization of an immigrant novel. So it begins very much in the Midwest, um, in the city that is about as uh, American as possible. And the characters are Ethiopian, but they are very much in America. And they are looking at America with the eyes of Africans, but they are in America. And they are understanding their relationship to this country, I think pretty much like every other generation who's come to America has had to do. Um, and so I wanted, it seemed as if, you know, by, partly because it's my own biography, of course, because you know, I couldn't have had a more American childhood, um, but also as a question of kind of an aesthetic function um, to kind of locate the book as centrally in the heart of this country as possible um, to kind of say like these are still American, American narratives now. Once they are here, they become a part of an American narrative. They become a part of an American history and culture just because parts of it happened in Africa it doesn't take away from the fact that it's become now part of our natural culture as well. Uh, our whole culture has kind of been this sort of product of multi, you know, many different nations being sort of hoisted upon this place and pulling them and dragging them into this country and creating new stories out of them. Um, so that was, um, you know, both a sort of personal and emotional desire to kind of, you know, create the story that kind of mirrored my own, but then very much also to, to, to see if I could make that kind of point through, um, through a kind of like narrative structure.
it all makes it sound as if I have so many interesting things happening in my life. Um, I, I'm, um, I'm reading, uh, right now I'm reading, uh, so it's like people ask me that question. I'm, I'm, I'm on a plane pretty much every day these days, so I'm not reading much. But I'm reading John Cheever's journals, um, uh, which are beautiful and brutal and, and, and quite exquisite to read. Um, they make you actually want to stop being a writer because you realize, like, man, I don't think I could do that for that long. Um, I mean, but in terms of kind of like my own um, sort of, you know, I mean, I read a fair amount of nonfiction as well at the same time because I, I do work as a journalist every now and then. Um, and so I kind of stay fairly engaged with kind of politics in Africa um, quite heavily. And so um, until recently, I was doing a lot of work on Eastern Congo. Um, so I was reading a lot about sort of conflict and the sort of history of conflict in Eastern Congo. Um, that was a project that I finished um, the very beginning of this year and um, took up a lot of my time. Uh, I'm working now on another novel, um, which will have some vague similarities between this book and this first book. And um, in terms of my own development, I, you know, it's like I began reading American literature. I mean, the sort of my, my process of wanting to become a writer, I think, was born out of um, both an absence of kind of narrative. Um, we have no sort of real stories about Ethiopia growing up, and so there was this rather than kind of having a traditional narrative of saying I became a writer because my family told me stories about Africa and it was great and I wanted to write about Africa. Um, it, was the, it was almost the exact opposite. We had no stories. Um, all we had were kind of a, sort of sh ghosts, I think. We had a kind of shadow narrative that followed us around where we had stories of family members that had kind of been killed or disappeared during the revolution in Ethiopia. And so I would hear names oftentimes as a child. Um, and so I think that kind of made me very acutely aware of how important narrative was. I, um, by a really young age, I, I really fell in love with, I think, poetry and books because I, I found kind of narratives in fiction um, to kind of, they found, I found a kind of space inside of those stories to, I think, almost em to fill in the empty spaces in my own life. Um, and so, you know, like I read a lot of, um, sort of beat writers when I, was, when I was quite young. And then as I grew older, um, from James Baldwin to Ralph Ellison, Toni Morrison, Philip Roth, Saul Bellows, um, a lot of Saul Bellows, um, V.S. Naipaul, um, um, a lot of poetry still. Um, like the title for this book and the first book both come from, from passages of poems. Um, the first book comes from the last line in the Commedia by Dante. By Dante and this the title of this book is uh, Indebted to Rilke and the Duino Elegies. Um, Housekeeping by Marilyn Robinson. It's been a sort of a fantastic novel for me over the years. Because I do journalism um, sort of post books, like I never, I never try to do journalism while I'm, while I'm in the middle of a book because it would take too much, too much time. Um, but what, I, what I've found in the stories that I have worked on in the past is that they do, they remain a kind of permanent part of my consciousness. And so the first novel, because it has this sort of, there's a lot of characters who talk about dictators and coups in Africa's history in the novel. And I made those all up, the people, the coups and the wars were all very real, but I did a lot of research on them. And as soon as the book was over, I thought it would be fascinating if I could actually see um, who these kind of rebel leaders and coups and dictatorships are. And someone was silly enough to send me to Africa to go start doing that. Um, but it was very much with the idea to just kind of see how much my imagination and reality could, um, could sort of coincide together. And, and this book actually has a lot of um, passages and moments that, ha that happened in Sudan in the late 1970s, but that are very much indebted to passage to scenes that I've witnessed in Sudan, um, you know, in 2006. Um, but it also would have, could have been just as easily, easily happened in 1978, because the sort of scale of violence when it does happen happens in the exact same way. And so finding that, um, that these, there's this kind of cy cyclical reproduction of, of the way these sort of wars are enacted, um, uh, that kind of ended up entering its way into my fiction without my quite planning it. Uh, I think partly because there's no, I had no space for those images in journalism. You know, journalism you're confined to a much shorter, um, even if you have you know several pages, you don't actually have enough space to kind of breathe all of those uh, stories out of you. And so fiction 
you know, you have one, you have years to sort of write a novel, and two, you have years to process those images, and so they end up filtering their way through your, into your work in, in a more subtle, um, and I think, more personal way than they do. That's a good question. I think um, there is a loss with, 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 with immigration. Um, something is sacrificed, I think, in each, in each sort of moment of departure. Um, at the same time, I mean, the, the, the very, very, very privileged life that I have, um, in terms of the education I've been able to receive, um, the, sort of the fact that I can write, actually, and make a living as a, as a writer, um, all of those are products very much of having been in America that would not have happened in Ethiopia if I had stayed. Um, one, not only because of the climates, I mean, the sort of political climate, but to the economics of the country. Um, there's not that same education system, there's not that same um, political freedom, that same level of expression that, that would have been possible. Um, I go back to Ethiopia uh, every few years now, and I feel quite attached to, to Ethiopia, but at the same time, I'm always aware of how far I stand on the outside. I, have, I look Ethiopian when I'm there. I'm completely Ethiopian until I open my mouth, and then everyone says, ah, <laughs> we know where you're from. <laughs> you're from one of those big countries. Um, and that's true. Um, and I, 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 for a long time, I, re I felt only the loss. And I was very occupied with what, what had been lost and felt very much like you know, some important part of my identity had been sort of forever sacrificed. I think now I actually think that I have a hybrid identity that is constructed between both nations, between Ethiopia and America, that is uh, entirely purely personal in mind and that somebody in Ethiopia wants to say I'm not Ethiopian, they can, you know, um, easily walk out the door, to put it gently, in the same way somebody in America wants to say that I'm only Ethiopian or that I'm only African, they can also, you know, um, go away <laughs> quietly or quickly, however they choose, because of that, my identity is forged out of both of those places, and that, that took effort and time, um, but that's where, that's where I stand now. And where is home? Um, home, um, I, I, you know, I live, I live mainly in Paris most of the year, um, but home for me now, I think because I've constructed it out of pretty much, I think I've fought and earned my place to feel at home anywhere I am. Um, I'm, home is where my family is, where my sort of like friends and family are, and, um, but at the same time, I think because I've forged my sort of sense of home between all these different places that I can, I do feel like I can literally live anywhere in the world right now and not have any sense of like homesickness or loss because they've, I've learned to kind of, one, take those places with me, but two, um, the kind of identity that grounds me isn't attached to a specific topography anymore, to a specific place. It's very much attached to the people who are near me. And as long as I keep them close to me, um, physically or at least through Skype, then, then, I, then I feel like I'm pretty much at home. <laughs>